Oh my god. Is everybody dead? <gasps> no, 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 no. Everyone is fine. Don't lie to him. He's scared. It's okay to lie when people are scared. I want to go home. Oh, sweetheart, you will, okay? I promise. Tomorrow you will be home and your mother will never let me see you again. <laughs> Hi, welcome to To the 90s and Beyond. My name is Vince Leo. I'm the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since the mid-1990s, 1996 to be exact. You can read all of my written work. Quipster.net is where to go, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. If you like the show that you hear today, I do encourage you to not only listen to back episodes of this podcast, but I also encourage you to check out my other podcast that I do that is very similar to this one, except it dips back a little bit further. It goes back to films of the 1980s primarily, and it's called Around the World in 80s Movies. You can find it wherever you're listening to this, or you can go to my website, quipster.net. Find the link there. Today, I'm going to be getting into the fifth of the six-part series, looking at the Jurassic films, Jurassic Park series, as well as the Jurassic World trilogy, at least that's how it is so far. The second of the Jurassic World films, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, will be today's episode from 2018. But I do have a lot of material to cover here, so we'll jump right into it. This is, as with all of the other films, PG-13, because of that science fiction-based violence that you expect from a Jurassic film. Although this one does dabble a little bit more into horror than some of the others. Bryce Dallas Howard and Chris Pratt return. Daniela Pineda, Isabella Sermon, Justice Smith. Jeff Goldblum makes a small appearance in this film, as does B.D. Wong from the original series as well. Toby Jones, Rafe Spall, James Cromwell, Ted Levine, and Geraldine Chaplin are also in this film. The screenwriters are Derek Connolly and Colin Trevorrow, and this time it's directed by J.A. Bayona. Now, after the smashing success, the smashing international success, a huge, very profitable movie, Jurassic World, producer Steven Spielberg, he was over the moon as to how well it did. He congratulated its director, Colin Trevorrow, with a gift of a menorah with a T-Rex base. He dubbed it the Menorasaurus Rex, but the celebrations really did not get to last very long. The sequel was announced while Jurassic World had barely opened in theaters in 2015. Trevorrow and his longtime writing partner, Derek Connolly, they were worried because they thought to themselves, what could they do to live up to Jurassic World? And even worse than that, Steven Spielberg wanted a trilogy, which meant not only coming up with the second film, but also conceiving a story for the third. During this cross-country trip that they took back to Trevorrow's Vermont home, Trevorrow and Connolly brainstormed to flesh out what would become a basic story idea. They stopped in various towns to see how different people were reacting to Jurassic World while it was still in theaters to get some ideas for how they should approach the second film. They agreed that the series should probably stop being about the dangers of fiddling with science because it's already been fiddled with. Future sequels should thematically become about the ethical dilemma of trying to live in this new world that has been created through that change, through that fiddling. How would the dinosaurs feel about living in this world in which they were no longer meant to exist? Dervaro would also have to sit this entry out as the director, though. He would write, he would also produce, but he did agree at that time to direct Star Wars Episode Nine. at least at the time. Eventually, he was replaced yet again in that series by J.J. Abrams. Trevorrow rationalized that, like the Star Wars franchise itself, or maybe like the Mission Impossible films, the Jurassic franchise could probably make each entry unique by changing directors and making it a stronger series overall, although he fully did intend to return for the third entry. Steven Spielberg, he requested that the action would move, as he had wanted to for so long, away from the island and onto the mainland. Other global companies were going to come in here. They could emulate InGen and their desire to develop their own clone dinosaurs. Trevorrow agreed to break from the island, but he did want the story to follow the Nublar dinosaurs specifically, not a new batch. Although much of the first half of the film does take place on Isla Nublar, 
the eruption of the volcano that's on the island ensures that there never can be a return to that island, at least not for a long time. The volcano angle does provide the ticking time bomb suspense and the molten lava does deliver the eye candy intention for several set pieces that you will find in this film. Although the volcanic nature of Isla Nublar is not really referred to in the original film trilogy, it is mentioned in Michael Crichton's original Jurassic Park novel that there was a dormant volcano there and it was also placed very judiciously on a map of Isla Nublar without commentary in the 2015 film, Jurassic World. Trevorrow did look to the espionage thrillers for inspiration, 1975's Three Days of the Condor, also Steven Spielberg's own Bridge of Spies, for their way of changing the nature of everything midway through the film, which would alter the film's trajectory and its tone unexpectedly, but it would not lose momentum. People would stay over the shift, and that's what he also wanted to do with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Trevorrow did concern himself with how audiences might react to the destruction of the island, though, but he did feel that it was critical to the franchise's eventual growth to burn that bridge once the dinosaurs did cross into the New World. Spielberg was a little bit skeptical here. He thought that it would take a little too long to set up the dinosaurs for the move that Trevorrow intended to England. So they dabbled initially with trying to find areas closer to Costa Rica because the island of Isla Nublar is just off of the coast of Costa Rica. They thought maybe this one should take place more in Central America, maybe Peru or Ecuador. Cabo San Lucas was a popular choice. They wanted to set the film up and then maybe save England for the third film. But Trevorrow eventually found a way to make the move work using giant cargo ships, something that he wouldn't spend too much time on. He found a way to kind of condense that portion of the film. Jurassic World, the 2015 film, it was bright, it was very colorful and very fun for most audiences. But Trevorrow here, he wanted to differentiate Fallen Kingdom by exploring a little bit more of a darker side, specifically of humanity's exploitation and the cruelty that we do employ toward other living creatures on Earth. Trevorrow mused that dinosaurs were like the discovery of nuclear power, First, they might be used for military purposes before they would expand worldwide. And similar to humanity's regard to environmental issues and climate and climate change, many people do avoid worrying about tomorrow because they are more interested in making money today. Trevorrow wanted here also a constriction, a claustrophobia in the second film before they would ultimately bust out wide for the third. He was inspired by the iconic scene in Jurassic Park that featured velociraptors chasing children through this industrial kitchen with its narrowing environs and horrific implications. He thought he could replicate that with this one. As moral questions would abound for Fallen Kingdom, Trevorrow did feel that this entry should return Jeff Goldblum back to his role as Ian Malcolm because he was the warner of impending doom for messing with nature all along. Trevorrow did not want Malcolm simply to return to Isla Nublar because he felt that that would be conceived of as a cheap gimmick. Instead, he envisioned Malcolm as kind of a modern-day Al Gore type, even though Al Gore still exists, warning the politicians in Washington, D.C. about the dangers of continuing dinosaur exploitation and that they should just let nature take its course by letting the dinosaurs get wiped out yet again. Goldblum's initial day of shooting did expand because he wanted dialogue changes, specifically ones that would tie in a lot more to the dialogue that Ian Malcolm espoused in the Crichton novels. Trevorrow also originally scripted Jake Johnson's character, Lowry Crothers, to return here. Johnson wanted Lowry to be changed dramatically from his prior harrowing experience. Now he would be sporting a ponytail and tattoo sleeves. But Trevorrow eventually reconsidered that because he felt that the sequel was already very dark and the character only added to the cynicism instead of offering the needed comic relief that he thought might be a little bit more satisfying for audiences. So Trevorrow replaced Lowry here with younger, much more idealistic characters to be environmental activists who wholeheartedly believe in Claire Deering's new cause. Claire Deering here now would be that activist, the leader of an activist group. Owen Grady, who would return here, by contrast, he's not an activist like Claire, but he does want to save the life of his beloved trained velociraptor, Blue, as we experienced in Jurassic World. 
Owen really wanted to live life on his terms, but he eventually finds himself compelled to act here because he realizes that there are things that affect all of us on this planet we all live on. We can't really sit idly by when there's nowhere to run anymore due to those big changes that are going on in the world. After receiving blowback for killing characters that really weren't deserving of being killed in Jurassic World, Tavaro here made sure that the characters who die horribly in Fallen Kingdom were ones that the audiences would feel truly deserve it. Trevorrow initially envisioned also bigger, prolonged set pieces, but the producers wanted the tempo that he had originally put into his early scripts slowed down because they wanted to expand the universe, especially save some of that stuff for the third film. The characters should be built back up to explore what they'd been doing for the past three years instead and how the dinosaur experience would have changed them in that time. Trevorrow and Connolly they set their story following the closure of Jurassic World, where its dormant volcano, Mount Sebo, has become active, threatening all life on Isla Nublar. Humankind starts to debate whether the clone dinosaurs should be saved from extinction yet again because of that volcano, or if they should be saved. Claire, as I mentioned, she's become a conservationist. She's an advocate for this dinosaur protection group. She feels an overwhelming responsibility to save these dinosaurs that she once considered merely a commodity. After John Hammond's billionaire associate that we find out, his silent partner, Benjamin Lockwood, he's on his deathbed. His assistant, Eli Mills, hatches this plan to Claire to fund the relocation of these dinosaurs from Isla Nublar to a sanctuary island. Claire agrees with this. In order to save the dinosaurs, she gathers a team, including Velociraptor Whisperer Owen Grady, Super Hacker Franklin Webb, and this paleo veterinarian Zia Rodriguez. The team, when they get to the island, is stunned to discover they're not alone. Mercenaries are there on the island, gathering dinosaurs to bring to the mainland, predominantly for greedy, nefarious purposes. There's more to the story than that, but that's the basic setup. Turning toward the director, as I mentioned, J.A. Bayona is the director of Fallen Kingdom. He was originally a serious consideration to be the director for Jurassic World before Trevorrow was attached because he had a reputation for Spielbergian themes in his films. And also he had a, a disaster film under his belt, The Impossible, which was very critically acclaimed. And that showed that he could handle large scale effects, heavy features, even with a budgetary limitation. Bayona excels at blending genres. He also is known for deeper characterizations, for escalating tension, and also incorporating childhood nightmares to try to layer upon the specific adventure elements in his films. But Bayona, he insisted on completing his next slated film, A Monster Calls, first, before he took on Jurassic World. And he also was somebody who insisted on considerable preparation time. And he wanted to do that following making a Monster Calls. And the producers of Jurassic World were just not willing to wait. After spending so many years trying to get the fourth Jurassic film off the ground, they just didn't want to take the chance of more delays. They wanted to strike while the iron was hot. And Bayona happened to be available for the second film. And they pitched it to him and he absolutely loved what he heard, especially that the sequel was going to have a distinct narrative direction that looked at dinosaur survival instead of human survival this time out. Trevorrow himself was a huge fan of Bayona's work, and he agreed that he would be a perfect choice. Or if he wasn't going to be available, they could also look to fellow Spanish horror Helmer Juan Carlos Fresnadillo. But Trevorrow decided to write with Bayona in mind, and he wanted to put the second film firmly in his wheelhouse as a director so he could knock it out of the park. He would shift from a disaster movie to more of that gothic horror that Bayona was known for, with dinosaurs inhabiting this large mansion for the second half of the film. Bayona was himself a huge admirer of Steven Spielberg's films ever since he was a kid. During his stint as a film professor later, he even taught a film class specifically on Jurassic Park. Bayona here injects a lot of elements. He wants to pay homage to Spielberg's filmmaking style. He rewatched a lot of Spielberg's older films and he read Crichton's books. He wanted insight into their storytelling technique. He noted that Spielberg seemed to borrow a lot from his own Indiana Jones films when he made Jurassic Park. He captured a lot of the same pace and humor of 
those early Hollywood serials, they inspired Indiana Jones. They also seem to be inspiring a lot of Jurassic Park's greater thrills. And that inspired Bayona to also study the silent comedies of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton for further inspiration for elements of Fallen Kingdom. He drew from these, as you can see in the film if you watch the movie, for a scripted scene where Owen escapes oncoming lava, his body is immobilized by this tranquilized dart, and he's kind of comedically trying to avoid the lava as it gets closer and closer. Further homage does come in the casting of Charlie Chaplin's granddaughter, Geraldine, a Bayona regular, by the way. She was in a, pretty much all of his films, as the nanny to Maisie, the granddaughter to uh, Lockwood. Bayona also very much identified with the thematic question whether clones should be regarded as legitimate life or if humans should consider them expendable because they are brought about into existence through artificial means. Bayona has a twin brother, so he's kind of a clone of a sort, and he himself struggled to form an identity independent of that relationship despite being what he felt was a completely different person than his brother. So he very much identified with the feeling of being a clone to somebody and people associating them as somehow one entity instead of individuals. He emphasizes here the folly of Lockwood cloning his deceased daughter, as we come to find out. That's one of the big reveals of the film, that Maisie is in fact a clone. She might look the same, but Maisie here, as we come to find out, is her own person, despite what she might appear outwardly. The working title for Fallen Kingdom initially was Ancient Futures that referred to the dinosaur existence, both in prehistory, of course, and as well as, we presume, in the future. This was never officially the title, though, even though that was what people told others that the title might be. Trevorrow and Bayona would not reveal the actual title during the production because they wanted to keep internet speculation about what the film was about at bay. Trevorrow initially wanted each entry in the trilogy to have a different title that started with the word Jurassic. You know, Jurassic World for the first entry, Jurassic something for the second and third. But Spielberg, while he did approve of changing the trilogy's name from Jurassic Park to Jurassic World to separate them, he did feel that additional changes to the word Jurassic were going to confuse audiences, so he nixed that and decided for more of the subtitle to Jurassic World instead. Trevorrow did want to minimize here Easter eggs, callbacks to the prior films. He wanted more of a forward-looking turn instead of regurgitating a lot of what we had already seen before. Bayona, though, happened to be a little bit in disagreement with that. He wanted fans to feel comfortably familiar with what he was going to present in this film, so he upped a lot of the Spielberg homage in this film. So in addition to those aforementioned Indiana Jones references, he placed a toy version of E.T. inserted into Maisie's bedroom, specifically for Spielberg's fans. Maisie herself is also shown wearing a red hoodie, very much like E.T.'s Elliot. After collaborating with Derek Connolly for eight months, Trevorrow did eventually serve as the sole on-set writer. Connolly had to move on to other things, Bayona contributed to several story changes himself. He wanted a, a prolonged James Bond-type opening because he felt that the script, as it had been written, had a very long and talky first act. He didn't want action to be off the screen for too long. People would feel the lull early on. He wanted to start with a bang. So they crafted this opening where mercenaries are going maybe just a few months after the original Jurassic World ends. Mercenaries go, they go back to Isla Nublar to try to obtain a DNA-rich bone from the decayed body of the Indominus Rex amid dangerous dinosaurs within the human abandoned dangerous remnants of Jurassic World. Bayona wanted another action scene added during this lengthy sequence aboard the cargo ship, the Arcadia, because the ship basically was just a series of holds. Space for action was going to be very limited, so they brainstormed a sequence where Owen and Claire try to extract blood from the T-Rex to try to save Blue's life. And during the editing phase, they also had another idea to intercut the scene of Blue's surgery with flashbacks using Owen's video diaries of him training the Velociraptor hatchlings. The story here in Fallen Kingdom highlights specifically human greed for dynamic effect by Ona replaced a scripted scene of animal traffickers meeting in this underground garage to try to trade dinosaurs' lives for money, he envisioned it more with more eye candy, like a Sotheby's-style auction where dinosaurs are bid upon 
by black market profiteers. This also would incorporate Steven Spielberg's longtime desire to introduce weaponized dinosaurs into the series. Fallen Kingdom, it was shot primarily in cinemascope format, the widest of the formats used in the Jurassic Park film, ultra widescreen presentation, because Biona wanted to capture more action, he wanted more dinosaurs on the screen than in any prior film in the series, and because Biona felt that the modern films were oversaturated with CG, he wanted to bring back more practical effects than in any film in the franchise since the original. Bayano sometimes used animatronics, knowing that they would eventually be replaced by CG, because he specifically wanted to give his actors something real to perform against. He felt that that would enhance their performances. Bayano also formed a pact with the actors before the shoot that he was going to genuinely scare them from time to time. He wanted to get truthful reactions that could be used on screen to make people feel that the reactions that they're experiencing are completely believable. The animatronic dinosaurs would suddenly move or maybe emit a roar, something that the actors didn't know was going to happen that drew a lot of genuine flinches and sometimes screams. Trevorrow also had more experience after doing Jurassic World with adding those animatronics to the film. So they were able to capitalize on the experience. And of course, Spielberg had experience, many, many years of experience as well. Spielberg did advise them not to frame the animatronic dinosaurs completely within the frame because by not putting them completely in the frame, the dinosaurs would appear larger because they would occupy more space than the frame would allow. Bayona also, on the set, not necessarily in the film, although there are a couple of instances where he uses John Williams' music, but he used it during the filming of certain scenes as well as in the preparation for them. He also added dinosaur roar sound effects from prior Jurassic Park films while he was on the set because he wanted to capture the mood for the actors before each scene. The soaring theme music of Jurassic Park also stirred these actors into tears during the emotional moments. Everybody on the set pretty much grew up with Jurassic Park being one of their favorite films. And so that original John Williams music did have an emotional resonance to what they were doing in this film. Now for a scene, uh, an action sequence in this film where Claire and Franklin, the, uh, the IT tech guy, they're catapulted while they're inside a gyrosphere off of a cliff and into the ocean. Bayona wanted real emotion visible on the actors' faces, so he explored existing theme park rides to try to simulate the fall, but he found that matching the lighting and the backdrop in a real park was tricky to try to put into the film, so he felt it would be more efficient and economical to build an onset 40 foot slope that could free fall for about three seconds or so. So we could film that. He could also control the lighting and the environment and also capture the look on their faces as they went into that fall. For the ocean landing, the gyrosphere was submerged in this huge tank in Pinewood Studios and the actors and the camera operator, they had undergone training in scuba for their safety while they were trapped 30 feet below the surface in this uh, gyrosphere environment. But Biona called that the scariest part for him to film, and it took about five intense days to complete it. For a scene where uh, Barry Onyx attacks the characters amid lava pouring down from the ceiling, Biona wanted realistic lighting despite all of the elements of the scene being relegated eventually to CG to achieve the right flickers of light to try to shine around the room and on the faces and bodies of the actors, they set cat litter doused with flammable liquid on fire and then poured it through cracks in the ceiling as it poured down. The result was liquid fire that the actors could interact with and it provided the right lighting, the right smoke for the scene without the need for additional CG elements. The new dino baddie for Fallen Kingdom is the Indoraptor. It's a genetic hybrid of the Indominus Rex as well as a Velociraptor. Biona wanted here to pay homage with the Indoraptor to classic Hollywood. He wanted the Indoraptor, which Spielberg called the first true monster of the Jurassic franchise, to also emulate a lot of those old monster films. The, there's a specific nod to 1933's King Kong. In fact, there's, there's several. Regarded as Biona's favorite movie featuring dinosaurs, he wanted big gates opening to reveal the uh, Indoraptor. The Indoraptor's shadow-like entrance is patterned after the vampires in F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu. 
He also added a couple of elements of John Badham's oft-forgotten 1979 flick called Dracula. That was a film that Biona saw when he was about five years old that left an indelible impression, and he wanted to recapture some of that feeling when he was a young kid watching that movie. He also found sympathy for the Indoraptor, framing it as a sad event upon its death, similar to Frankenstein. In fact, Biona sent a picture specifically of Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster to the design team on what he wanted the Indoraptor to kind of resemble. They also added some ticks, some trembling in the Indoraptor's movement because they wanted to denote that the Indoraptor was basically a prototype hybrid. It was forced into existence before it was really ready, and that was because of that human greed that's so much a theme of Fallen Kingdom. Now, for the Indoraptor design, Biona pulled a lot of children about what they found scary about dinosaurs. So he opted to go with a kind of a black-skinned dinosaur with very white eyes and teeth, and that would make it especially scary when it's in dark, shadowy places. You'd only see those eyes and teeth. There were also early plans to have two Indoraptors in this film. One would be white, one would be black, and that would give the the film a, a sense of mythology, the intent was for the black one to kill the white one in something akin to a biblical Cain and Abel story, but Biona pulled back from that. He determined that there just was not enough room for additional high concept ideas like that one. You know, this film was already jam-packed with so many ideas, he didn't want to distract from, from all of it. So he wanted the Indoraptor to have long human-like arms that would increase its eeriness, kind of a human-like eeriness to it. Additional themes for Fallen Kingdom include human use of technology to try to control nature. You know, the more that humans rely on technology, the less control we seem to have over our situation as humans. Innovation, that definitely is something that helps the uh, quality of human life, but it can also be used to destroy ourselves, kind of like atomic power. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Weapons of death happen to be more in demand in this world than ones that are meant to preserve life, unfortunately. Billionaires, they're surrounded by spineless lackeys who foster the notion that they can play God with the world, something that's very much tied in with the Lockwood character in Fallen Kingdom. There are also, if you're an astute follower of American politics, Donald Trump allusions. This was filmed and, and pretty much released during the Trump presidency, so allusions do abound. The film does explore megalomania, greed, wealthy egotists blatantly disregarding the consequences to society through their actions. The president in Jurassic World disbelieves the existence of dinosaurs. That kind of parallels Trump's disbelief in climate change, calling it a, a Chinese hoax or fake news. It's definitely kind of alluded to here. Toby Jones sports a very Trumpian type hairpiece, and Ted Levine's character makes a nasty woman reference that recalls Trump calling Hillary Clinton that name during one of their debates. Biona insists that these were not scripted, but because he gave the actors free range to improvise, they simply could not resist drawing a lot of the inferences from real life, recent politics, into the performances, into their dialogue in the film. Learning from our past, that's something that's crucial to humanity's survival, but when our politics becomes untethered to truth or history or science, our future begins to grow ever more perilous. Lockwood here, he has a very rose-colored view of the past. He sees John Hammond as a philanthropist, hero, rather than a greedy showman who didn't learn until it was too late. He wants to restore the greatness of what he feels is Jurassic Park again, but hubris abounds because ethics are expendable in service of personal ambition. Although many think of the past as the good old days, every era is flawed and full of peril, Humans could never have survived in prehistoric days. We dare to think that we can tame dinosaurs today, although they dominated the Earth completely at one time in a much more dangerous time. A return to the past seems to be an acceleration of doom for our future, as embodied here. Cloning Lockwood's daughter attempts to resurrect that past, but she becomes the savior of a key of the past that endangers the future of humankind. The film embraces ultimately the theme that clones are as real and are as valid as those created through conventional means. We share the planet with all of the other animals of the planet. We must deal with the consequences of our actions toward them all. And we find here that we would surely perish if we continue to abuse and exploit 
animals in nature as a whole. We are reliant upon them to a large extent, and we have to learn eventually to live in harmony with the nature and the animals around us. There's a scene here t- depicting pteranodons in Las Vegas that was kind of a stinger that was put in the film after the credits. Originally, it was going to be just a deleted scene, and they were just going to show that on the Blu-ray, but uh, they decided here to put that as kind of a teaser of things to come. Trevorrow's original story treatment really wanted to expand the dinosaurs into the mainland a lot further in the second film, but the production team felt that maybe they should hold all of that back. They already had a lot of ground to cover. They should put that for the third film, maybe just put that one teaser in. There's a reference that was also cut out to Zia being a lesbian, that was pushed out of the finished film reportedly for time, although you know it wasn't something that was intended to be dwelt upon for very long. There was a, a dialogue that reveals that Zia doesn't date men, but if she did, she'd date someone like Owen Grady due to his handsome features. It would have taken only a few seconds, but, but they claim that uh, there just wasn't enough time, although other people will tell you that because of international markets, they tend to uh, remove some of that stuff that doesn't play as well in other cultures, specifically China. When it was finally released, reviews were pretty mixed as far as uh, the overall grades for Fallen Kingdom. It did get a lot of praise for its visuals, but there was a lot of criticism here for having a muddled plot. The script, a lot of uh, critics found very lackluster. Those were the big detractions from the film. Some felt that this entry really didn't provide many good or interesting ideas for the franchise moving forward. But because of the strength of the rejuvenated series, Fallen Kingdom did still rake in a hefty $1.3 billion worldwide, and that made it the 12th highest grossing film of all time at the end of its run. It finished third place among money earners in 2018 itself. So Fallen Kingdom, in addition to the $170 million budget, pumped about $185 million into its promotional campaigns internationally, twice that of Jurassic World. Trevorrow directed Goldblum also to promote the film in a commercial for the Jeep Wrangler that debuted during Super Bowl 52. The commercial depicts Ian Malcolm out running a T-Rex in a vehicle very similar to the iconic sequence in Jurassic Park, only this time Malcolm is the, in the driver's seat and then turns the tables by chasing the T-Rex in the vehicle before returning it back to the car dealership with the punchline that this was all just a, a test drive. Before the release of Fallen Kingdom, it was announced that Trevorrow would return for directing the third entry in the new trilogy. He was to co-write the film with Pacific Rim Uprising scribe Emily Carmichael. And that's something I will delve further into when I talk about Jurassic World Dominion for the next episode, the 2022 release. So pretty much a new release as far as this podcast goes. As far as what I feel about Jurassic World as a whole, I do admire a lot of what they were trying to do in this film. I do feel it is somewhat convoluted. I don't really care for a lot of the characters, especially the new characters that are put into this movie. I don't like a lot of the the directions that this film goes. So I'm a little more tepid about this. I think it's probably on par with some of the sequels for the first Jurassic Park. Not quite as good, not quite as fun. I respect J.A. Bayona and what he was trying to do here, but I don't feel that in terms of entertainment value, it is as high here for me as the original Jurassic Park, certainly, and also Jurassic World, I felt, was a much more fun rehash. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the park itself kind of is the fun part of the Jurassic series. Just having dinosaurs in modern day doesn't seem to be as fun as that. So maybe I'm a little bit less enthused about what I'm seeing here, especially as the park, basically, Jurassic World, no longer really exists as a place to be. And I'm also very confused. And if you have an answer for this, I'm sure somebody must have thought of this at some point. Maybe I just missed it. But, uh, you know, we already know that Isla Sorna was the uh, place where dinosaurs did exist, primarily even more abundantly in The Lost World as well as Jurassic Park 3, and yet we're not really given a lot of reasons to think that the dinosaurs would be extinct here. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. But feel free to write to me if you have a reason why a volcano on Isla Nublar would also make the uh, Isla Sorna dinosaurs extinct. 
So for all of that, I will give Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom two and a half stars out of four. Two and a half stars on my scale means that I do think that it had the goods and had the tools and talent to be something that would be worthwhile. You certainly had a good cast here. You got a great director. You've got the production of Steven Spielberg. You've got all the money in the world to really throw at this film. And yet what results is mediocre entertainment. It's a lot of eye candy that definitely should please fans of that sort of thing. But from a storytelling standpoint, I don't find any of this nearly as interesting as apparently a lot of the people that were writing this film seem to think that they're doing something very new and novel and revolutionary for the series. But to me, it still seems very formulaic, maybe not to this series, but to a lot of other series including ones that feature dinosaurs or some other kinds of monsters or creatures that get out and uh, are either protected or exploited by humans. It's definitely a theme that's been done time and time again in Hollywood features. So two and a half stars out of four is the best I can give. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Obviously, there are some of you that might have a differing opinion about that. You can write to me if you so desire and let me know what you think about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. If you think that it definitely deserves more than two and a half stars, let me know the reasons why. Or maybe you don't even think uh, it should be as generous as that. (laughs) Maybe it's just an atrocity to you. You can also let me know why you feel that way, too. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. There are links to my Twitter feed, my Facebook page, my Instagram there. Email is the best way to get in touch if you so desire. As I mentioned next week, of course, Jurassic World Dominion. I haven't even seen that film at the time of this recording, so I really have no idea how I'm going to feel. So I hope that you will join me for that. Until next time, thank you everyone for listening as we explore all of the films as we go to the 90s and beyond.